know what, guys? There's no evidence for this stuff that we're doing, really. If you if you get down um, uh, any sort of textbook, like Dawson, right, sitting up there, you go to the cha- end of the chapter, masses of, of uh, references. Mm-hmm. And I had learned to look at those references and, well, you know, they're worth nothing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Protrusive Dental Podcast. A very special episode, something very different. Do you believe in canine guidance? It's the first thing that we're taught at dental school. It's the only thing that you remember about the occlusion aspect of dental school. Whereas having been to many occlusion courses and then championing the role of canine guidance, I did always think, why is it that some of my AOB patients are just fine? Why is it that Some of your patients, in fact, most of your patients, according to some studies, do not have canine guidance. And why is that okay? I think we've covered it a little bit in some of the episodes of Barry Glassman before, but I want to bring something completely different to the table today. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Andy Toy, who's a fantastic dentist and mentor uh, based in Nottingham. He is uh, an educator for Invisalign, and he treats TMD, does orthodontics, and he has a massive interest in occlusion, hence why I connected with him. Uh, the The story about Andy, and you'll hear his story throughout, is very fascinating, how he did all the traditional roots of... uh, occlusion was also in in favor of the traditional mainstream sort of knowledge about canine guidance and then how he met some people and how he also considered that there may be another way to think about occlusion that might be another theory that we should consider and that theory is the pgo which is posterior guided occlusion so imagine everything you know about occlusion and turning it upside down And then thinking, whoa, I mean, this blew my mind when I first came across it. Uh, So as part of the handout of this episode, I'm going to leave Andy's ebook about PGO for you to read because this is a two-part episode. Part one, this one, is more the introduction, how Andy had done all the other occlusion uh, bits and bobs and then learn about PGO. And then we talk a lot. We get a little bit deep into the PGO and I leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger. Sorry, not sorry. And in the next episode, we're going to get into how to actually apply PGO concepts in our patients and how to actually make it practical. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you is a communication one. What about when you get a patient in, maybe you've seen this patient a few times before and their oral hygiene is just not up to scratch. They still have plaque at the gingival margins and you're not 100% happy. How do you communicate to a patient? Sometimes it's embarrassing to, as a dentist to, to say to a patient, look, you know, you're not doing a good job, especially when you know, they come in, you have a nice chat, it's someone you've been seeing for quite a while, and then to put like this negative twist uh, on the appointment and say, look, I'm not happy with your oral hygiene, which we have a responsibility as clinicians to do. So I think there's a tactful, tactful way to communicate that to a patient. That actually, you need to do a little bit better in a, you know, keeping politeness and kindness and sincerity at the core of it. So my protrusive dental pearl is that if you want to tell a patient that they need to improve something about their oral hygiene, here's what I like to do. I like to ask their permission and it works every time. So I say to a patient, may I kindly have your permission to give you some feedback about how your cleaning is going? Or may I kindly have your permission to give you some feedback about how your brushing techniques are going? And always like, yeah, give, yeah, fine, yeah, please tell me, I'm really interested. And then you show them in the mirror that, look, here, 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 you're doing amazing. Please keep this up. I'm, I'm really, really happy with this. But can you see around the lower anteriors and you move the lip out of the way and then see all that uh, mature plaque that they've been missing for, for probably weeks and months? And then you show them, look, look, uh, with, with a probe and you lift off the plaque and that I'm just... Uh, concerned that you're missing this plaque and you probably haven't realized it's probably because of the fact that um, it's so low down your toothbrush just not reaching and just with a small change in technique we can get your gum hygiene from 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 and they are so so appreciative of, of having advice given to them in this way and it's much better than saying look um your, your general dental checkup today was fine but you're 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 you 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 need to do better with your toothbrushing it, it's not only more specific but the fact that before giving them criticism you allow them to give you permission i think that's really powerful so let me know what you think about that anyway i'm not going to take any more time let's join the episode with andy toy on posterior guided occlusion part one hi there Hello, Andy. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Jess. Nice to see you. You too. It's, it's, it's great to, to finally meet face to face. We've been talking on the phone and emailing uh, on the run up to this podcast. So it's great to finally have you on on yes, the Protrusive Dental Podcast. It's a real pleasure. And I'm so looking forward to our conversation. 
I am too, because one of the things that I, I want to do uh, with this podcast is I want to make it a a voice for all. I mean, I, I don't what I don't want this podcast to be is a reflection of just my beliefs uh, and mainstream beliefs, because what I want to do is listen to um, other alternative options, because I think that's how we can uh, expose ourselves to, to new treatments, advancements, um, you know, in the long run. So. I first uh, heard about you when my, my friend, uh, the Vitalani brothers, were doing a study uh, day, like a, a couple hours evening session, and it was posterior guided occlusion. And that's when you came my radar. And we'll talk about that okay. today, but I also understand you, you teach on the clear aligner diploma. I do. Yeah, yeah. That's most of my work nowadays. Brilliant. And so, so tell us how, uh, how your sort of career has evolved into this, you know, occlusion, uh, clear aligners, orthodontics, and, and, and just tell the listeners uh, where you work uh, and a bit about yourself. Okay. So I qualified uh, way back in 1980 in Bristol when the world was black and white and <laughs> uh, felt a lot simpler. And I was very lucky because I had three years of undergraduate training in orthodontics. So we saw patients all the way through and so I, as soon as I got into general practice, orthodontics was part of my life. And it was all removables, functionals and stuff like that. I was really, really lucky with my first job because I effectively had vocational training before it existed. And my boss, Bob Borrell, was always interested in extending his knowledge and applying it in practice. He was a really strong general practitioner and willing to go out on a limb. So. It was a friend of his, actually, he was a perio consultant in Sheffield. And here's me sort of hanging on to the tails of Bob Borrell at 22. And uh, you could see I was really into my dentistry and, and, and just like you. And he said, uh, you ought to find out about occlusion because we're starting to think about occlusion and restorative dentistry and stuff. I said, yeah, that sounds good. He says, you need to go to the Pankey Institute. Right. So there I am, 1981. He's mentioned this thing called a Pank Institute. Now, there's no internet in those days. But he says it's I can't important. imagine this world. Right? Well, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I write to the Pank Institute, and I met a couple of dentists who were in his sort of um, uh, friendship groups as well, and they were very encouraging, just like you would be with a young dentist. So I strolled up there in 1982 in November, going there to learn about occlusion, okay? And I sit there... Um, in the first morning, you sit in a big in a big sort of circle, and uh, you tell people why you're there. And I'm the youngest by far, so over half the dentists were ancient, as far as I was concerned, which meant th over 35, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and yes, there, sure. so I'm, I'm here to pick up on Dr. Pankey's philosophy and all that sort of stuff. I'm wondering what the hell is all that about? Anyway, Pankey is alive at the time, so he comes in about 11 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, and he starts to talk about you know, why the Institute is there and his some of his personal stories. And then by the Wednesday, the penny drops, you know, this is there's more to dentistry than just occlusion. You've got to look at the patient as a whole in a comprehensive way, um, not just teeth and gums and jaws, but, you know, their emotions, their personality types. But also then it's what about your life in dentistry? So this really, really helped me at the time and it got me very, very excited. So I'm, I'm really getting into occlusion and I go on all of the occlusion courses I can go on. So I don't know if you ever heard of Roy Higson. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, so Roy set up the British Society of Occlusal Studies and I went on Roy's very first course that he set up. And it was actually he set one up and he brought Jim Orr over from the Pankey Institute because Roy had done all the Pankey stuff. And I went on that. I went on Harold Gelb, Brendan Stack. I started to do courses with osteopaths and chiropractors. Uh, Brilliant. I did cranial osteopathy week. You know, I, I, I learned how to tune into the cranial osteo um, cranial sacral system. I mean, the world, we got into nutrition. You know, the world just opened up. And you, you're willing to have a look at anything and try it. So I made a, a TND part of my uh, practice in life as well. I mean, you need a certain approach to TMD to be a, a certain type of practitioner. Uh, but because I'd done a lot on the sort of personality and people side of dentistry, it really tuned in with that. And that carried on. Um, and uh, I, I was part of the BSOS. And, you know, we went on courses with them. I remember very well still, actually, um, Henry Tanner coming to Warwick at the early 90s. 
And we had three days with Henry Tanner, for instance. We were getting into trigger points and all that stuff. Um, and anyway, that's part of your life. Inclusion is part of your life. And, Definitely. Uh, in terms of orthodontics, um, I started Streetwire Ortho in the 90s. I did the University of Sheffield course up there and started doing more and more ortho. And so that was part of my general practice life as well. I enjoyed it. I'm pretty useless with my hands, to be honest. So um, I don't know if you know <laughs> Nilesh Shah, but Nilesh became a partner with me in, in Loughborough, when I, where my practice is. And uh, he's so good with the dentistry. You know, I passed all the blood stuff to him. And he's, he was doing all the crown preps and stuff like that. But I was more the author and the TMD. And the it, it's stuff. interesting, Andy, you say that because I always um, I, I did have this once upon a time, a belief that if you don't like dentistry, do author. <laughs> OK, <laughs> well, but I've, I've since moved on from that. I, I definitely don't think well, that's true anymore. Know, I think it worked in, in a way. <laughs> so, I mean, you learn you learn to do the things you love. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if you can manage your practice that way. And that's one of the benefits of having your mm. own practice. Anyway, so another thing that was in my life was um, I got in heavily involved with the faculty and I was doing a lot of teaching with foundation dentists and things like that. And in the 90s, about the mid to late 90s, this thing about evidence-based dentistry comes into the world, right? So um, and what I was a really, really strongly in favor of really good general practitioners. Specialists are great. You know, and the academics are great. We've all got our part to play. But I feel very, very strongly that the general dental practitioner is really the top of the tree, to be honest, rather than the bottom of the barrel, like they're often mm. thought by specialists and not everyone. So anyway, I'm part of the faculty and we're getting involved with teaching and research and evidence based dentistry comes out. And all these academics are producing these this research and I'm looking at their, their results and I'm thinking, well, that just doesn't look right to me. That doesn't apply to the population I'm seeing in Loughborough. So I'm getting a bit pissed off, to be honest. Can I say that on Prosciutto? Oh, you can. You certainly can. I just have so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> because these academics are telling me what it should be like, and it's not like this, right? So I decided to get into some practice-based research. There was a whole sort of, you know, um, uh, movement then to do research that's based in practice. And I start getting involved with that. And I'm part of the local NHS network and the deanery and all that stuff. And one of the things I do is I decide to go on the uh, Oxford University evidence-based dentistry course. Now, that was run by Derek Richards. So you might know him because he was the editor re until recently of evidence-based dentistry as part of the BDJ. Okay. So Derek, um, lovely guy. He's from Wales and the Valleys, as it happens. So, you know, we had a tune tuned up in that, in that sense. And I was beginning to learn about what is the nature of evidence, okay? Another thing that happened in my life is I'd taken a master's in clinical education. So clinical education involves a lot of social science research, okay, and evidence. And I started teaching the social science research module on that course. So I'm now teaching clinicians and nurses and all that, and dentists and stuff like that, all about social science research. So I'm getting heavily into what do we mean by evidence and understanding that actually scientific evidence is just one type of evidence. And whilst you and I might have been brought up to think this is the truth, mm. you really, you start to appreciate, well, actually evidence has different levels of quality and applicability and actually, no matter how much evidence you've got, nobody's got the evidence for the patient in front of you. 100%. So you have to understand the limitations of the evidence as well. So all this was part of my life. And, uh, but, and also into occlusion, right? So there was a BSOS study trip to the University of Florida. Uh, I think it was 2002 or 2003. And we went to the Parker Mayhem Facial Pain Center, University of Florida, Gainesville. Henry Gremion was the lead uh, uh, director there. Parker Mahan was still alive. And Parker Mahan had taught me TMJ um, in, at the Panky Institute in 1983. I mean, he was a fantastic personality. He, he brought anatomy alive for me, you know, in a functional sense. They used to, they'd have him in for three days. So that they'd have to build you up for two days. So you're ready when he hits you <laughs> like a train. Right. And Parker Mayan comes in. So Parker Mayan 
had obviously donated a lot of money to the University of Florida, they set up this facial pain center. And there was 12 of us from the UK, and we go over and have five days at, uh, with Henry Gremion, seeing patients, doing exercises and stuff like that. Halfway through the week, um, Henry comes up to us. He said, uh, we've got a, a, a colleague of ours um, who's visiting Parker. Parker's his mentor. He's a guy called Ron Presswood. And he really likes the Brits. He goes over to the UK a lot. And, but, and he's got a particular way of looking at occlusion. Are you interested in listening to, to Ron? So we all say yes, don't know what else to do. So they stick us in this little lecture theater. And there Ron turns up at two o'clock. And uh, Ron is this quiet, introverted Texan who speaks very quietly, almost speaks out the side of his mouth sometimes, you know, and you have to sort of really stop and listen. <laughs> He's introverted. He's an ultimate, like, biomechanical engineer. And he, he can go off at tangents and stuff like that. And anyway, he starts to give us his presentation on his views on occlusion which is the posterior guided occlusion. And I'm sitting there listening and I'm, I can't, don't quite understand what he's talking about, but he had serious evidence because all the way through that week, I'm telling these, and we're talking to these dentists, I'm saying, you know what guys, there's no evidence for this stuff that we're doing really. If you, if you get down um, uh, any sort of textbook like Dawson, right? Sitting up there, you go to the chat end of the chapter, masses of, of uh, references, mm -hmm. and I had learned to look at those references and, well, you know, they're worth nothing. So we changed in the 80s from volume quantity of evidence to in the 90s and early 2000s, it's about the quality of the evidence. And the quality of the evidence for occlusion was very, very poor, okay? I knew that stuff worked, but the way that I'd been taught at Pankey and all these other places and modified it to my own thing, but so I wasn't wrong. Occlusion was important, but the evidence was poor. So Ron mm -hmm. is standing there and he's coming up with some serious evidence, such as anthropological studies. OK. Um, the other thing about Ron was that he'd been one of the original teachers at the Pankey Institute. So when they set it up, I think there was 12 or 13 original teachers and Ron had been a teacher there right from the start. He then taught with Henry Tanner for 20 years. Wow. So I didn't know what he was getting. It was very challenging what he was telling me because it feel like, felt like it was like 180 degrees from what mm. I was being taught and practicing. But he had evidence. And I thought, I've got to listen to this guy. I've got to get to understand it. Now, the, one of the reasons it's challenging is we're all sitting there. We spent thousands of pounds to get there. We're all under BSOS. We've spent tens of thousands of pounds learning about occlusion in our time, right? And I bet you're the same. Yep. And you get embedded in one way of thinking, you, and you almost have to enjoy, you have to say it's right because you, you know, you've, you, you've you, you, you're, you're pot there. committed. You are. <laughs> and, you know, if you say it's wrong, you feel a bit stupid, to be honest. So, I, you know, I, we all get, this is one of the things about occlusion, I think, we all get entrenched and one of the lovely things that I've noticed about you is you're willing to be what I call positively skeptical, right? Mm, mm. You just don't accept it, but you're not going to ignore it either. Definitely. So anyway, and that, that's, a, that's a stance that I would like to take. So Ron tells us this stuff. And uh, I go up to him at the end, you know, and introduce myself because he's a panky guy and things like that. And I said, that's really fascinating. I don't really get it, but I really want to know more. And he says, well, I'm coming over to the UK in three months' time. Why don't you come to the study club? So he's off down to Bristol for a study club. I listen to him again. You know, again, I get a bit more understanding. So I invite him up to our study club in Loughborough. So three or four months later, he comes over to the UK again. One of the reasons he has to come to the UK is because he, he can't talk about this stuff in the US. He gets shouted down. Mm. So he's this quiet little Texan guy, right, engineering type. And, you know, there's people with vested interests on teaching a certain type of occlusion, approach to occlusion over there. And he was saying, it's not like that. It's not like that. Mm. Well, okay. Andy, for the, for the benefit of those listening, some of the, the young dentists uh, out there who may be uh, UK graduates, for example, which is uh, the majority of my listener base. Um, I know I have some from America and to those listening in the US right now, please don't be offended by, by what I'm about to say. But in the US, just as you mentioned, Andy, it, these conferences 
they do get very heated with the different mm. occlusal camps, let's mm. say. And I've heard, uh, you know, uh, of fistfights breaking out at these right. <laughs> events and stuff. So th- right. just to put, give some context to what Andy is saying here is that, you know, that's probably a good reason why um, Dr. Presswood was not able to, to, to speak yeah. uh, about his yeah. very alternative view at the time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So he and, and you know, he wanted to, to explore this model. Right. One of the things I'm going to really enjoy about our time now is you're going to ask me some questions about it. And every time we talk about it, we learn something about it because it needs to be tested. It's just a theory. But I think it's a better theory than all the ones I've seen before. So Ron comes over and I've seen him a few times. I'm still not 100 percent sure because he's telling me that it's not really about canine guidance. Right. And I have worshipped at the altar of canine guidance for <laughs> 20 years, okay, and tried to build it in. And I can imagine, I can remember building massive bits on my splints to get the canine involved, <laughs> okay? You know, I've spent that time. And he's telling me it's not like that. So I still don't really, you've got to, you've got to get into your own clinical experience to really, really trust something. Mm-hmm. So one of the th- approaches that he taught me, and this is the way that he and Henry used to teach the splint courses, He said you start to, and this is a great tip actually for anybody doing TMD, okay, is you let the patient drive the adjustment, Uh right? So the patient, it's not your splint, it's the patient's splint. So one of the things that you do is you put a splint in, tap, 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 rub, rub, rub. You say, what does it feel like? Is anything that feels like it's in the way? And they point to a spot, they take the splint out, He'd point to it and say, is that what you mean? He says, yeah. Can I adjust it? And mm-hmm. I say, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we adjust it, okay? And so they have patient-driven splint adjustment. I love now that. You, you will have in your back of your mind, I think I know what this should look like at the end, right? But you let the patient drive it. Now, when you let the patient drive the splint adjustment, they don't want canine guidance. They don't like the rat. <laughs> okay? So I was starting to sort of pick that up. The other thing that happened is I had a patient. She was the daughter of a local dentist. And she'd had, obviously, she's a great big class two, so you can see this. And as a teenager, she'd had four fours taken out, everything driven back. And she had a really deep, tight two div two. Mm -hmm. And she had horrendous TMJ head and neck pain, horrendous. And you can just imagine that the mother you know, how bad she felt because she's a dentist and she ought to be able to do something about this and nobody could do anything about it. And she was one of my first patients I put on a PGO splint, right? And I'm telling the mother, let's try it. Let's have a patient-driven splint adjustment experience. And so the mother then is sitting in the corner there. And we basically, one of the things that you want to do is to get some what we call freedom incentric. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yep. And I was basically building and building and building and building the vertical here and getting that release, okay, of those that deep bite. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I basically said, well, we kept driving it. She said, kept saying, I don't like this at the front. I kept taking it off. And I, I had the her actual teeth po- poking, just poking through the anterior section. I can no visualize run, that. Mm-hmm. Right? And we send her away, and it makes an incredible difference. And so I basically just put put it. It felt a little bit like the old Gelb spinning. I don't know if you. I was, I was just going to say that it, it seems like a uh, almost like a posterior, like a pivot appliance, almost a yeah. Gelb appliance. You know it, it, what you're describing there. It does, Philippe, but it but it's more because I've done loads of them. Mm. But actually, the working part of the splint is what we call a centrum at the back of the splint, and mm-hmm. I built that in. So it wasn't just a flat plane or a Gelb appliance was designed to move the condyle into this, some sort of special position and stuff like that. It wasn't that. And I, it did cover the anterior teeth, but mm-hmm. there were some little windows there for the because I'd ground so much away. Sure. Anyway, made a big difference to her head and neck facial pain. So the penny was really starting to drop here, and I'm thinking, yeah, well, so all my splints then, I started doing as, as PGO splints. And I, I got good results with my normal Tanner appliances, to be honest, because the way they teach you the Tanner appliance at Panky, they teach you freedom in centric and make it very mm-hmm. flat. And um, it's just that they say you should have canine guidance and immediate posterior disclusion. 
So what I was doing here is was I was creating a centrum at the back with no posterior disclusion, but smooth and harmonious, patient driven, because they'll tell you if it doesn't feel right. And I wasn't bothering to put a ramp on at the front unless the patient, you know, eventually got into it. And I was getting good results with pain, just like I was getting with my tanner appliances. But interestingly, a lot of the clicks started to clear up as well. Because mm. I used to say to the patient, I think I can make a difference to your pain, but I'm not too sure about the clicks. But if they, if you're out of pain, would that be okay? They say, yeah. And so, but I was finding with the PGO splints that the clicks were starting to go. So that was an interesting experience. So. Wait. In my map of the world, Andy, the, the, the way I can, because it's, it's funny, right? When you learn something and then you apply it and then you you figure out supposedly a way something works. And when someone else offers a, an opinion and sometimes you could say, okay, maybe I was still getting good results, but it was for different reasons than when I initially thought, exactly. which is why we had that phone conversation. You, you'd mentioned that and, and I, I really, exactly. really respect that and I really like that. So in my map of the world at the moment, when you, when you said exactly what you said, I'm thinking that by having these centrums, you're giving the temporomandibular joint a bit more support by, you know, by, by having a bit more uh, posterior guidance, if you like, rather than uh, less support. For example, the more, more you anteriorize a, a splint, the more uh, seating you get of the condyle and that may be compressing some of the tissues. I mean, that's me being very okay. biological engineering type. Okay, so you're right in terms of support, but you, get, you do want a seated condyle. Right. And so the reason that you get a more stable condyla position in function is because you're switching muscles on. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a significant difference to every other approach that I've heard in dentistry that, you know, you get health when you switch muscles off. There's something about the overworking of the muscles. So I'll take you back now to my work with chiropractors and osteopaths. Mm, please. This is one of the sort of challenges I used to get. And I learned this particularly off osteopaths. They were all about function. And it wasn't, whilst they work in a structural way, what they're really interested in is the patient's function. So when we were looking at a patient, you, you start to see, well, they're not symmetrical. You know, is that a problem? And they say, not really, because you can, you can be functional in an asymmetric way because nobody's asymmetrical, okay? And so, and they would be always when they're talking about joints and stuff is that we want to make these muscles strong around the joint. And then, you know, I don't know whether you've had a knee injury or anything like that. You know, you go and get treatment for it. What do they want to do? They want to strengthen the muscles. And yet the jaw joint, they're trying to switch muscles off. What Ron was coming back with, he says, well, actually, no, we want stronger muscles. A healthy joint needs good, strong muscles. Okay. And you can go to Wolf's functional matrix. Okay. And uh, there's a, a basic biomechanical principles that show that the, the structural part of the joint is dictated by the function. Mm -hmm. yes. The better function you have, the better the joint. Okay. That's like a functional matrix uh, theory as well, right? Most functional matrix. Yeah. Yep. So you've got, so, so when eventually a part of the story is then Ron keeps coming back over and Ron gets a, a, one of his patients offers him a uh, quarter of a million dollars to do some research, all right? So Ron comes back over to Loughborough, he says, I've got a quarter of a million dollars, you know, and I was telling you I'm interested in practice-based research. And always when we're trying to do a research project, the money was always the problem. Mm -hmm. This time, we've got some money, right? So I'm thinking, right, we've got some money now, let's do something with it. So I write to all of the dental schools I know in the UK have got an interest in TMJ and occlusion. And instead of me saying, I'm a GDP, can I come and do some research? Let's, you know, they say, no, I'm going to be funding. I'm saying, I'm a GDP, can I come and do some research? And I've got a quarter of a million dollars, right? <laughs> a better so, proposition. So anyway, send all those emails off and uh, guess how many replies I got. I think I sent eight emails. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's probably going to be not very much, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Zero. Absolutely zero. So Ron comes back three months later. I say to Ron, we've done a, we've done a whole study club. It's, it's four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Everybody's gone home. And I said, Ron, I can't spend this money. It's, and I said, the, the dentists just don't get it. 
We need somebody who understands muscles and joints. And then a penny drops. I'm in Loughborough, right? Literally a, a mile down the road is one of the world leading sports science universities. The best, okay? I'm thinking, hang on a minute, forget the dentists. Let's go <laughs> to biomechanics because that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. So next day, I write the email. At this point, Ron and I had written an article. Uh, we got published in the in the faculty journal. Um, it was a historical perspective on on occlusion and stuff, right? Because, and we brought in some of this anthropological stuff that Ron had uh, got involved with. Anyway, I write to the head of the department, and uh, two weeks goes by, no response. Okay, so you're in practice, right? So you know what it's like, you get patients you get to know, and there's a particular patient, Maria, she'd been a patient of mine for probably 15 years, her and her family. Maria was from Eastern Europe before the Iron Curtain came down. She mm -hmm. was an Olympic rower, and she basically defected when she was over on a competition in the UK. She'd gone and knocked on somebody's door and said, I want to leave East Germany, okay? And she'd come to live in the UK. She'd ended up as a research assistant at Loughborough University, okay? She comes in to see me, and your 20-minute appointment is five minutes doing the dentistry and 15 minutes talking about what's going on. And she says to me, oh, what are you up to? And I said, Maria, I've just written to your head of department. <laughs> oh, because I'm interested in this research. I've got a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, what did he say? I said he hasn't rep replied. She says, send it to me, okay? Within two days, I got a response. The next week, he sent me to see this guy called Dr. Matt Payne, who's like leading one of the research teams. Anyway, eventually, we get to do some proper biomechanics research at Loughborough University, all because of those connections that I had, the luck that we had. And we spent it's, it's, it's amazing how these things work out with patients sometimes. It's just amazing. So, so then with Ron, then we did some serious research at, um, at Loughborough, uh, su uh, surface EMG muscle testing and uh, the effect of uh, occlusion on the action of the muscles. And this is uh, peer-reviewed research, and we were working with three PhDs uh, in, in Loughborough. And these guys, they don't give a damn about occlusion and whatever model <laughs> of occlusion, and whether you're a Dawson guy or a Tanner guy or a Coyce guy or whatever it is. For the love of science. Their, well, their job is to do top-class science. Otherwise, they're mm -hmm. out of a job. Mm -hmm. So... Um, these guys really know their biomechanics. And Steph Forrester, she has actually now done more SEMG uh, measurements on masseters and temporaries than anybody else in the world. And uh, it is, you know, it's first class, basically. And it was there to test the effects of different occlusal conditions on the action of the muscles uh, of the head and neck. And actually, they found you can only really measure two, and that's uh, masseters and anterior temporalis. Mm -hmm. You can put stuff everywhere else, but you won't get a decent measurement. They wouldn't allow yep. for that. In fact, um, this might be the time, I don't know if there's time in the story where we, I've got, you know, I asked you to get those lollipop sticks. So my my uh, wife is a, at the moment, so to put context, if, if you're listening to this episode in the year 2021 or something, uh, it, it's, the, it's the lockdown period, COVID-19, and my wife uh, conveniently is a COVID uh, swabber at the moment. Uh, oh, after okay. after suffering from COVID herself, she's now a COVID swabber, so she's doing a, a great work for the NHS on the front line, and she was able to uh, get these wooden spatulas 72 hours right. uh, before so that they can hopefully be COVID-free by now. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got them ready. Okay, so we could reproduce. This is one of the things I do on the courses. We can reproduce a bit of the of the evidence. Okay, let's do it. So is this a good time to do this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so basically we looked at. Uh, and I can show you the uh, results as well if you want. But we looked at the um, six different occlusal conditions on healthy subjects, which I think is significant because we're we're, we're trying to define. What is a healthy jaw joint and healthy jaw joint function? And when you know what health is, then you know how far they deviated from it and you know what you're trying to aim for. And one of the but problems the, with... The definition of health is, um, I'm sure you did it very methodologically, properly, range of motion, I mean, the whole law, absence of... Yeah. It's, not, it's not just absent of symptoms. Uh, did you take MRIs, for example, to confirm health? 
No, they did it on. There's a they use a internationally accepted um, definition, and you know the patients reported no pain, ability to chew, and a good range of motion. Whatever, okay. I can't sure. remember what sure. it's exactly. Is. Yeah, and all of these guys are, are pre, were left for university students, um, basically. Um, a lot of them were triathletes, actually, because Steph Forrester ran the tri club, and they're trying to keep in with her, so they'd, you know, <laughs> they'd, they'd uh, get involved with research if she said so. And so you can do it with um, tongue blades. Uh, we actually used, um, for the posterior ones, we used cotton rolls, actually, but these will do anyway. Sure. So um, what we did uh, six different occlusal conditions. We did a clench, okay? We did an anterior blade parallel to the maxilla, right there. Mm-hmm. We did an anterior blade steep. Yep. So you probably heard of Lucia jigs. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's effectively what a Lucia jig is. Yeah, yeah. We did one blade, uh, occlusion on one side, mm-hmm. uh, occlusion on the other side, and then occlusion on, posterior, that is, and posterior occlusion on both sides. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what you find is, Funny enough, um, in these healthy patients, when they clenched without any blades, you had pretty good uh, uh, contraction of the masseter, pretty good contraction of the anterior temporalis. And not only that, it should be coordinated as well. They spent a lot of time in those first few milliseconds of, of, of contraction and see whether it was coordinated and there was a high level of coordination. Now, we all know this. When you put the blade at the front, mm-hmm. flat or steep, what they found was the temporalis shut off, okay? The masseter still did function, slightly less, mm-hmm. but the temporal, basically the temporalis shuts off. Which is how and anterior midpoint stop appliances, uh, you know, the main role in their function. Exactly. And, and one of the ways that I've been taught, you know, if I get a really, really challenging patient, it's a lot of pain locked up, is you put a little lucid jig in, and just send them away. And I would still do that, consider doing that to this day, because whilst I'm saying we should turn muscles on, we want strong muscle function, you can overwork a muscle. Just like you and I go to the gym and suddenly we start working on something and you know, and it'll be painful in your arm or whatever it is. But we shouldn't be necessarily be switching muscles off in if we're aiming for long-term good or good health and function, okay? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's just that would just be a small interim stage. So anterior like that or that temporarily switches off. Masseter still works a bit. Mm-hmm. Now then, when you put it on one side at the back, okay, you'll find that the opposite temporarily switches off. Yeah. So I don't know whether you'll be able to feel it there, but what you want to do is when do it with nothing, uh-huh. do it with nothing at all. And get it anterior temporalis, and you should feel, hopefully, not only a good volume of contraction, but also quite coordinated as well. Yep, coordination and uh, yep, a decent volume, yep. Okay. Now you put a tongue blade in on one side, just posterior, and you should feel that the opposite side is either later or is less volume. See, I'm one of these freaks. I'm just being very honest. I'm just one of these freaks. I think it's less, but um, it's not as much as when I do something like this with my patients. I, a lot of my patients, they would switch off or be significantly less. I'm a bit less. Uh, so I think, yeah, mm-hmm. I, in principle, I can vouch for that. I'm just a freak. Uh, I, I, well, I'm a very parafunctional patient. Uh, I, I've got quite um, hypertrophic uh, muscles myself. Uh, okay. But but yes, um, there is a difference between the side where I've got the wooden spatula, which is contracting normally, and the other one, uh, or, or well, and the other one is not contracting as much and yeah well one thing that might be happening is actually you've not got really good volume either side okay because the other thing then they did was when they found that the optimal and maximal contraction and coordination was when they put cotton rolls Mm -hmm. in between the teeth it was better than the clench so let's put it in both sides now a really clench and mm-hmm. certainly in my mouth, I've got more volume. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? So now if you compare it, I think you'll find there's, certainly in my mouth, there's less volume than I had 
on this side than when I had both of them in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So the the maximum contraction and coordination was when they had cotton rolls in there, which was mimicking food, basically. Mm -hmm. So let's think what's happening now, because you started to talk about and um, when you have an anterior contact that it's affecting the uh, ability of the condyle to really seat. Mm -hmm. OK, so if we think about this here. What's happening when you're biting down on this side? This condyle is shifted over to the left, and it's because there's no contact on the teeth it's on that going, side. It's seating. It's, in, it's higher. It's in space, mm -hmm. and the muscles will not contract because it's not in a stable position. As soon as you get a contact on that side, the muscles will then contract. Right. So you need the contact on the both sides before the muscles will contract, and that really allows the the condyles to seat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because so essentially, this condyle is in space. Yep. Until you get a contact on that side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now then, we don't eat like this. We eat like this. Mm -hmm. So you have to have contact throughout that movement, which means that you have contact on the non-working side. So then, the, we shift over to this side. You still need contact on this side. You should not have immediate disclusion. Because that will be an unsupported side. joint on the other side. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, it's an inference from the data, but why does the, um, why do the muscles contract maximally and in co most coordinated way? It is because, we think, it's because it allows that condyle to really seat into Zola's tubercle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we know Zola's tubercle is the, is the point of greatest force because that's where the uh, bone is thickest and the cartilage is thickest, okay? Now, there's an area here, Zora's tubercle uh, is, a, is an area of contact, which also says there's not one position for the condyle, okay? It moves around. I don't know if you ever saw that x-ray movie, they could never do it today, of somebody, you know, a whole side x-ray with somebody chewing, live uh, x-ray. I've seen, uh, it's like a lateral skull view uh, of it them uh, chewing, yeah. Yeah, and what's the condyle doing? It's doing this. A lot, okay. a lot of movement. And the point is, this is what it does in function. Mm. And one of the problems that I had in my my t my training is that, you know, when we look at the way in which the teeth are clued together mm. and we slide them from side to side and things like that, we're looking at these gliding movements. We're not really look at them, um, looking at them in function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me on to the, the other exercise I do when we do a um, – a course, okay, and this is referencing Bayron's work back from 1964. So Bayron looked at occlusal contacts and the difference between occlusal contact in function and in gliding movements. So we can do this now, you and me, okay? Sure. So put your teeth together and glide out on your effect, on the side uh, your preferred side. It doesn't matter which side. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go out to the left. Okay. All the way out. Uh huh. And which I'm contacting on my left canine now. Uh, I'm very much in group function. Uh, so. And you've got group function. Okay. Yep. So are you going off to the left as well? I'm just going to the right now. To the right. And so if you're going off to the right and the teeth on the left are coming apart, are they? Uh, the amount of force I'm doing this with is just a normal, like you said, a glide. So Gliding. not much, just, just, yeah, just teeth contacting, r rubbing, if you like, uh, excursing to my right. So no, that my, I have, um, separation on my other side. Right. So you've got group function with posterior disclusion on the oppos opposite side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now just slide out to your preferred side again, mm -hmm. about a third of the way out. Mm -hmm. And this time you're going to crunch back with force. <clears throat> Okay. Yep. And just feel what's happening on that opposite side as you come back in to MIP. Okay. As I came in and just when I was almost there, I felt a contact on the other side and my masseter, I felt my master uh, contract on the left side. Great. So you, you felt the, and with force, there's not immediate posterior disclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you glide, there is, but when you put force on, mm -hmm. when you apply functional forces, 
the teeth come into contact. Mm-hmm. So when I'm trying to explain the difference between what I've been taught as canine guided occlusion in the past and the way we're teaching posterior guided occlusion now, I say there's two ways of looking at it. There's a sort of structural way. And there's, it's, it's either about the structure or it's about the function. And posterior guided occlusion is about function. Because when you look at occlusion with function, you have to factor in there's, there's compression of the joint, okay? The bone's compressing, the periodont ligament's changing. And in a, although it's a fraction of a millimeter, it's a significant fraction, teeth come into contact. Mm-hmm. And we know through our Loughborough research that switches the muscles on. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, which, which year was that Loughborough research, research, by the way? Uh, oh, off the top of my head, if we had the slides up, it'll, it'll be on the slides. Okay, I sure, think sure. 2007. Okay. Okay. Fine. It's the uh, Journal of Oral, Re- Oral Rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. We've done another couple of studies there as well. Um, I might, we might get into that one. Sure. So what Ron was describing was was actually confirmed then, it was just confirming what was this Bayron research had done way back in 1964. And when you do it with, with dentists, we've done it in all our study clubs, you get something, I forget what it is exactly, about um, 40 or 50, 60% are canine guided, about 30% are group function. And every now and again, you get somebody who's got function both sides, they got contacts both sides. When we ask them to bite back with force, you find about two thirds start to feel that um, that non-work inside contact. Sure. When we then go in with um, silk, uh, clusal silk marking paper, okay, mm-hmm. you find that contact on 100% of dentists. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, it's just that we're not always aware of it. Yep. So this posterior guided occlusion is coming out of what we see in nature. Right then, so back to Ron Presswood, okay? One of the things that happened in Ron Pre- Ron, Ron and Henry have been working together on this thing, and they've got this idea that this is the way that occlusion should be because it's patient-driven, and and they used to do minimal adjustment to the occlusion. You know, I was taught, you know, massive amounts of quill of abrasion, and you have to have dot, 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 stripe, dot, dot, dot. You know, they were doing just touching here and there because it was patient-driven, and the patients were getting better. So Ron's at a party. Andy, that, that was on splints or uh, that was occlusal equilibrations or, or both? Well, I, you know, I've done an equilibration course at Panky. I think may have done it twice, actually. Yeah. And, you know, we would aim to get that, uh, those dot, 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 stripe, dot, dot, dot on every patient. OK. And that was very different to the, what, what Ron was doing. Exactly, because mm-hmm. Ron and or Ron Henry are saying, well, actually, you don't really need the canines necessarily. It's really what's happening here. And mm-hmm. you certainly don't want posterior disclusion in that initial, what we call centrum thing. A but centrum that is with, with force. Well, because we're interested in function, right, then you should aim to build, if you, if you are building somebody's occlusion, you should aim to build in the ability for that, uh, that non-work inside contact to come in. And actually, I'm going to bring you on to my next prop now. I hope you can sure. see this. See this little spoon? Yes. Okay. And if you look at my ebook, I've tried to build this into the pictures. Yep. If you imagine, that's where the uh, centric stop is. Yep. Okay. And if this is the lower right second molar, as you move over to the patient's left, they, have yep. to, they should ride up and down. And moment. your finger, your finger there is the palatal cusp of the upper uh, second mo- upper exactly. first molar or second molar. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah. matter which. It could be a first yeah. or second molar. But that's the contact that you're looking for. OK. Yeah. There's a little centrum, a little bowl to allow a little bit of movement. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as they start to move off to one side, it rides up at least yeah. for the first millimeter or so at that posterior guide. Now, we call that a guide now. Up until really understanding Ron's work, if I saw that, I'd be grinding it away. Okay. Yep. 
because that shows me we've got haven't got posterior disclusion. So, so yeah, and that that and that's what we'd uh, classically be taught as a non-working side interference, and interferences are bad. Uh, you know, I, I, well, this is not what I believe in, but this is obviously because for me nowadays, with the the way I look at it in, in my map of the world, is that they are not interferences; they are just non-working side guidances. Now, what you're throwing on the table is is even you know is, is making me very excited. Uh, and what we, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you uh, at the end, just right. to debate this and explore this because. Right, this is really right. uh, great. But w- one thing I, I just want to highlight now with the, the, you were discussing the centrums and the contacts is that the reason I really resonated with you and the reason I was so excited to bring you on, on the podcast for everyone to listen to was, yes, you offer a 180 degree uh, viewpoint. And I think it should be heard by everyone, but you're the mm-hmm. first person who I've read in, in, in a book. And maybe that's because, you know, you may argue, oh, you haven't read all the books or whatnot, but you're the first person I actually read about the fact that most people who you think are in canine guidance, as soon as they put force and go, they go to one side, they're no longer, they're actually in group function. Um, so th- when I read that, I was like, hang on a minute. Yes, this, th- I need to actually hear out what you're trying to say. So right. that was one, right. one kudos point. Right. And so, you know, that's Bayron's work back in 64. But, you know, if you don't like that idea, you're probably not going to even look at that. Okay. But one of the things that Ron is very open-minded and he he is the only person I know who's gone back to look at every single book on occlusion and read every single book, right? Um, and he went back. What, what happens is you get Dawson, and now Dawson then would say reference Guichet. Yep. So you get Guichet, and Guichet references whoever it is, okay? And it goes all the way back to this chap called Bonwill. <laughs> in, in 1884. Now, I told you that I've been doing social science research. Yes. Okay. So this is what I understand is you have to understand the social history of what we, how we learn and what we learn about. So I'm going to give you a little bit of social history now of, of occlusion. Mm-hmm. Why do we think of occlusion the way we think about it? Is, is okay. that a rhetorical question or you want to answer that? Well, this is this is what I, this is this is actually Ron's Ron Ron is such an you know he's such a detail man. He says I've got to find I've got to find why we think the way we think because it's not matching what I'm seeing in the yeah. real patients, right? Yeah. And other bits of evidence. So it goes all the way back to Bonwill, and Bonwill was the first person in English anyway to write about occlusion. He was a very well known dentist. 1884. He writes this um, this paper. And he says the body is is designed on a set of equilateral triangles, okay, most clearly manifest in the mouth and jaws. And in the mouth and jaws, it's based on a four-inch equilateral triangle, four inches from here to here and four inches from here to here, okay? So where did he get this information from? In his article, right, in the article, he says, I had a dream. I was visited by God, and he described to me the way that the body is made up. Now, we're laughing, but in those times, God was part of science, okay? And in some people's science, it is still part of science. Fair play. But so anyway, we're four inches from here to here and four inches from here to here. So it tells me two things. I don't know about your God, Jazz, but Bonwell's God was clearly English because he used imperial <laughs> measurements, okay? <laughs> Right. Yeah. The second thing it tells you is it tells you the body is symmetrical because we're four inches from here to here and four inches from here to here. Now, how many patients have you seen who are truly symmetrical in the, in their physical form? Well, uh, having done a diploma in orthodontics, one thing I started looking at more was faces. You know, I really went from a dentist being looking at teeth to looking at faces. And right. the, the moment you go on Photoshop or, or Keynote and you flip transversely the patient's uh, photo, they look like a different person. Yes. Sym- symmetry does not happen in nature. No. It's not natural. OK, so who was a student of Bonwell? A certain chap called Edward Angle. And he then got into detail about describing the way the teeth meet together. Is angles class one, class two, or class three? And he, he, he references Bonwell. He was a student of Bonwell's. And so suddenly dentists have got this thing, oh, yeah, this looks right. Okay. 
Now, another part of our research team is a, is a dental technician called, called John Bill, okay? And John, because he really got into this as well, he looked into the history of articulators. So around about the turn of the century, uh, 19, uh, 1800s to 1900s, when Angles was coming out with his ideas, Ron had uh, also seen papers on a functional view of occlusion, and being challenged by the structural view of occlusion. So that's Anguil and Bonwell are the structural people. You, you, you know, you're healthy when you're like this, okay? And the functional people say, well, it doesn't matter so much how you are, it's whether you can chew or not. Mm -hmm. And there was this sort of competing ideas at the time. Now, the articulator manufacturers would go to both camps and say, tell us what you want, we'll build you an articulator. Now, the structural people, their maths was was normal standard nonlinear maths, okay? Because it's easy to describe. It's like a hinge. It's symmetrical, okay? The functional people couldn't describe exactly what they wanted because that is based on nonlinear maths. And the condyla, condyla movement and, and occlusal function is nonlinear. And nonlinear maths did not exist at the turn of the century, so basically, the articulator manufacturers pile in with the structural guys, and then somebody's got something to sell. So mm -hmm. it starts to build up from that. And these functional people, you know, got they didn't have a couldn't really compete with that or whatever. And frankly, I don't know you're you're not that old, but I can tell you a lot of my friends and colleagues who qualified when I did never bothered with the occlusion mm -hmm. throughout their whole career. And they just go on with life in their way, okay? And nobody died, pretty much. <laughs> so, so basically, the structural pe that's why the structural ideas got took hold, and then it all leads up to people like Kois, Dawson. I'm not so sure about Kois, to be honest, because I hear that, you know, he's far more functional. But, you know, the Dawsons of this world, Guichets, um, and, and certainly orthodontics, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. so your orthodontist used to be taught you've got to treat a class one. You know, mm -hmm. and get the patient to class one. And that's why that dentist's daughter had had four fours out. She had to get to class one, you know, yep. so the molars class one and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's it pervades everything that we think about. So when I'm teaching on the diploma, we do look at are they class one, two or three? But I say to people, look, this is not a treatment aim. It's just a description. And if you know you know how far they are from this reference point of class one, class one, it doesn't mean to say you should treat a class one because you have to treat according to the needs of the patient. And patients are not symmetrical. And some people's skeletal patterns are more two, some people more three. What you're looking for is a functional occlusion. And you can have a functional occlusion with a six millimeter overjet. You can have it with a minus three millimeter overjet. Mm -hmm. And you can be in a terrible, terrible pain if you have class one, and, you know, two millimeter overjet, anterior contacts, it doesn't relate to whether they're in pain and good function or not. It's not related. So how did I get there? So basically, I was telling that's you. That's very refreshing, though. It's, it's, you know, that's very refreshing to hear about. No, we, we, we don't have to treat everyone, everyone to, to class one. But still, on uh, as far as I can see, on um, postgraduate degrees and degrees in orthodontics, they still teach um, Roth Roth's uh, five sort of uh, principles, which very much echoes from Angles and Andrews, and it go continues on from there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's part of the structural school of mm. orthodontics. OK, yeah. what I would say. And so when I try and make a, a difference for people, I say, well, you either, you know, this is a structural way of looking at it. We have a functional way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. okay? but, but Andy, most specialists would call that. You know, if, if you say to a specialist, well, in this case, we can um, accept the, the degree of class two in this case. They would then say, OK, so you're going for a compromised treatment plan. Right. That, that term then makes you it almost undermine your entire thought process and what you're, right. what you're trying to do for the patient. Right. And so we have the evidence to show that the compromise, so-called, is actually the best way of treating this patient. Because I'm going to give you now, probably because we've been going on a bit, but I'm going to give you what I think is the killer piece of evidence. 
Okay. So that's quite heavy stuff. I hope you enjoyed some of Andy's stories of the origins. Uh, next episode, we're going to go really deep into PGO and we'll also talk about how Andy applies PGO actually clinically to his patients and what he's looking for in, in his Invisalign patients towards the end of the treatment protocols. So I look forward to catching you for part two of PGO.